Hello everyone, and a warm welcome to our latest Directions Live Online webinar. Today marks the start of a mini-series that's a special edition for you guys. Uh, my name is Alex Bland, and I'll be your host for today's session. As a reminder, before we get started, that we are recording today's webinar, and we'll be sending a link out at the end of the uh, session later in the week, um, so if you can, you can re-watch it and send it to your colleagues. Also, please do ask questions. Um, you can do this at any time throughout the session. Uh, there is a panel on the side of your webinar uh, box to fill in, and we'll endeavour to get to any of your questions at the end of the session. We should have some. We should have plenty of time for a couple. Now, today we're beginning a series of webinars focused on delivering cloud solutions for businesses GIS. And with me today in Brisbane, we have Todd Jackson, uh, our principal con solutions architect. And with more than 25 years working in the spatial and software development industries, Todd has a wealth of experience in enterprise GIS implementation and, and bespoke solution development. I can think of no one better to take us through our cloud series. And without further ado, I'll pass over to Todd for today's session. Here we go. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. Um, hello everyone as well. Over the next few weeks, as Alex said, we'll be delivering a little bit of content about cloud-based deployments in ArcGIS. So today we're kicking it off with ArcGIS security in the cloud. So some of this will relate to what you do on-prem yourselves and some uh, within the cloud yourselves, I should say. And some of this will be related to what we do within Esri Australia's managed cloud services. So one of the major areas of interest we have from customers relate, relating to cloud adoption is security. In the past, there were concerns that public cloud providers were inherently less secure because the infrastructure used to host a workload was not physically located at the customer site or that it was shared amongst other different customers. However, as more customers are leveraging now the economy of scale that the, the cloud brings us, cloud providers are actually building more and more security features into their service to manage those risks, to the extent that some of the features that are built into the, the services now surpass what you could do on-prem. Regardless of the security features of cloud providers, the security controls applied to an ArcGIS deployment in the cloud is very much defined by its logical and physical architecture. The other consideration is also that there are nuances to do with the ArcGIS platform itself. So I'll talk about some of those as well today. So the three big areas that I wanted to, sort of the broad areas that I wanted to talk about today are risk management, shared responsibility, and security by design. From a risk, managed perspective, risk management perspective, what we find is that the security conversation really starts out with customers around them wanting to gather a checklist of security controls that should be applied or implemented within their environment. The difficulty with this approach is that security really isn't sort of a tick in the box. Our cloud implementation represents a continuum of risk which needs to be assessed all the way across the, the spectrum from no risk to extreme risk, and then controls applied to mitigate the identified risk based on either the consequence or the likelihood of those things occurring. So we try to look at security from more of a holistic risk management approach, working from the whole to the part, if you like. And from there, we define what we need to do in terms of implementing controls or security controls or policies to, to mitigate those those issues. From a shared responsibility perspective, as I've already mentioned, a key aspect of cloud security is that cloud providers provide a certain level of security, e either at a physical level or at um, a set of controls that we can apply configurations to our own environments. But from that perspective, we need to be aware of what the shared responsibility is. So what is the delineation between what we need to do versus what the cloud provider has already done. And then lastly, the security by design. Once we understand those shared responsibilities and understand the scope of our solution, we can start to define our security design in conjunction with the overall solution, uh, solution design. So we're incorporating security into our solution from the very start. So starting with risk management, as discussed, 
It's important to reason about security from a risk management perspective. And one way to formalize the risk management approach is to adopt a framework such as the NIST cybersecurity security framework as I'm showing at the moment. So NIST is the, the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the US. And they provide this framework for risk management such that people can communicate in a single language what the, the the risk management approach is that's being adopted within the organization for managing cybersecurity threats. There's five main parts to the NIST CyberSec framework. The, there's, these five functions all work continuously and also in a way concurrently. So while it looks like there's a sequence there between the five functions, they all work iteratively together. And, and, might not be that um, you move from an identity function to pr protection to detection. You might be iterative looking at identifying and protection as you go. So if we look at those particular functions, identify is really all about identifying what our threats are, what the threat actors are, and therefore what they might be doing that could represent a vulnerability to our environment. From there, we need to identify what the impacts are, and therefore we can gather what the risk is of those threats occurring. From there, we need to really marry that up to what assets are at risk. So we need to know what, what factors are, that are inherent within those assets that make them vulnerable to particular risks. From there, we can start building out protections for those assets, so we can start to define either governance and policies or start, start to configure security controls within our environment to mitigate um, risks around technical assets or procedures to um, mitigate other aspects of business continuance through you know, backup and recovery strategies and testing of those to um, the way that you do patching, etc. Detection is a function that really involves looking at how our protections are going. So what, what are the controls that we've applied? How, are the, how effective are those controls? We need to measure that. We need to detect if there are any pot potential incidents occurring. We need to do analysis of our logging to either identify whether an incident has occurred or identify that we need to add additional controls and feed that back into the protection function or potentially even we might have identified other assets through our logging that we needed to protect from the very beginning. The response, uh, the respond function is really all about what we do in the case where a incident has occurred. So having planning up front around what we would do in the case of, of, of an incident occurring, what communications and escalation processes we have, what further analysis we need to do once we've identified an incident, and then what we need to apply in terms of mitigation to, um, to resolve the incident that's occurred. And the last phase of function is really looking at what it needs, what we need to do to reestablish a healthy environment in terms of removing the security vulnerability that occurred, removing any um, leftover breakage that was caused by that vulnerability and re recovering to a state where we are restoring from backup, we're restoring configuration to where our last known healthy point in time was. So understanding what we're doing from a, a risk management perspective allows us to really start to design um, what we're doing at, at a really high level around governance and controls and procedures, which we ultimately want to get to in terms of securing our environments. So if we talk, a little bit about shared responsibility. You'll notice that both AWS and Azure have been certified for protected level um, services within their, their respective public cloud environments for, for users or for customers of those cloud providers to stand up workloads that work with protected data. So in conjunction with that, the way that AWS and Azure present that is really a shared responsibility in terms of what features of security they take care of at a very physical level. So the way that they 
manage access to their data centers, the way they secure their their networks, their their physical hypervisors, the the way that their systems run internally, the way their administrators access the, the machines, etc. And they define a set of controls on what customers need to do for their own responsibility. So the way that AWS defines this is really AWS is responsible for security of the cloud, whereas a customer is responsible for security in the cloud. So there's an expectation there that AWS ultimately has that customers are using all of the security controls that they provide to be able to secure customer data, to secure the platform, the applications, do identity management, to secure their operating systems, network, firewall configuration, as well as all of the aspects of authentication, encryption, and network integrity, etc. Within Esri Australia's managed cloud services, we take it one step further in that providing a platform as a service for customers such that customers get a ArcGIS enterprise platform as a consumption layer and can start using that from, from what we deploy. That means that we've got a responsibility in the mix as well. So we define a section in the, the green area there where we're responsible for security of the ArcGIS platform in the cloud. We build all of our infrastructure upon AWS um, infrastructure. So we still maintain the, the same level of compliance with the security compliance they have at the physical and, and very low level infrastructure level. But we do a lot of securing of the platform ourselves, like the ArcGIS platform. We, we secure the, the operating system. We do monthly patching, etc. We secure the network and firewall configuration within the cloud. And we do all of the server-side encryption, so encryption at rest, en encryption in transit, and secure all the network traffic as well. But this still means there's an area of responsibility for our customers, to, and that's in the blue area at the very top, to still be cognizant of the responsibilities they have around securing customer data, identity and access management into the platform itself, and then any further network connectivity that's between their on-prem to our cloud environments. So if we start to look a little bit uh, at scope now and what the scope of our solution is and therefore what scope of security we might need to implement. At a very high level, we need to really understand the difference between protected data and publicly accessible data because that will ultimately control a lot of the way that we secure environments. So if we think about a system that's publicly accessible, maybe it's a public facing website that's got um, you know, citizen data that shows, maybe it's electorates where we can vote, et cetera. That kind of data is publicly accessible and it is still managed within a certain, um, a bureau that, that manages that particular data. So it's protected from that aspect. It's not editable, etc. but it's publicly accessible to read. The aspect there is that we, if anything's publicly accessible, we can't naturally control all of the end users that are accessing that data. So we need to consider it to be unclassified data out in the public space. On the flip side, if we were looking at protected level, um, security, really those kinds of environments where we're concerned with the transmission of, of application usage from the end user all the way to the persistence layer in, in our solution. So we need to secure the client, we need to secure the communications between that client and our application servers, and we need to secure our environments that host the application servers and databases, etc. So I'm just making that delineation because we get a lot of questions about you know, wanting to have protected level security, but be public, publicly facing applications. And there is some, there are some nuances there around what that represents. So if we look at this scope, we can see that there's a number of things that we need to consider around designing out what our security approach will be. We can see that we've got inbound and outbound network connectivity. There's users from external organizations that want to collaborate either with our portal within the cloud or they want to 
collaborate with ArcGIS Online with data that might be getting pushed out through a collaboration service and port from ArcGIS Enterprise to ArcGIS Online. We've also got users within our own internal environments interacting with the, the ArcGIS Enterprise environment, and maybe that's um, traversing the system over a more secure channel. We've got GIS admins that need to get to Bastion hosts to manage database servers and manage schemas within the environment. And then we might have a managed service provider that needs to um, transiently get into the environment to fix or resolve issues with machines, so needing to establish a transient VPN connection. Likewise, those application servers within our, our virtual private cloud in the environment might need to reach out to other AWS services, so we would need to secure those. So we need to look at, in addition to that, how do we deal with identity? How do we identify which users are accessing the systems? Which users are accessing ArcGIS Enterprise? Which users are accessing ArcGIS Desktop? And how are we, how are we going to challenge them for identity to reach those, those applications they're trying to get to? From an authorization perspective, we need to look at securing certain content from certain users. We need to look at encryption, so encrypting the transmission over the internet to our ArcGIS Enterprise using TLS, or the way that we encrypt data at rest on either the file tier or the relational database, or perhaps even in S3. And then how are we going to manage the, the instances themselves? How are we going to make sure that they're not vulnerable to um, viruses, malware, um, making sure that their operating systems are patched, making sure there's no inherent vulnerabilities in the operating systems they're using. So there's a number of sort of aspects of, to the environment that we need to consider. But taking the combination of our scope with our shared responsibility model, we can start to really design out what kind of controls will apply within our infrastructure layer to secure our, our systems. So we start with identity and access management. Really, a lot of the, the administrative usage of the AWS console or reaching the um, AWS command line interface will require administrators to authenticate with AWS. And that would mean really having some kind of credentials that are not really are easily rotated and could easily always identify the same user. From that perspective, it's always really important to utilize either a federated authentication identity manager, um, such as Azure AD or some sort of Active Directory Federation services to identify the users making the access and then be able to secure those users within the cloud. From a machine instance point of view, we need to be able to identi and identify certain machine instances as having either a role that can do something within the environment. So maybe it's about those, those machines being able to access other services within AWS. Or in addition to that, when it's somebody as in a user or a, an administrator that needs to reach a, a machine instance, how do we identify that, that user to reach that? How do we challenge for creds? And how do we make sure that we're managing credentials in a safe way? Likewise, applications, we need to manage identity within our application. So the, the best practice now with Esri applications is to start using identity managers such as Azure AD and other SAML2 compliant identity providers, as well as in all cases with these, we want to use the same identities that we're challenging for to be able to authorize those identities to content and other systems and, and resources. VPN, it's also a, a similar aspect. We need to be able to challenge for any transient type connections like a software VPN. We need to log into the VPN first, but we don't want to have creds that could easily be stolen or lifted. We need to be able to rotate those credentials or, or even better still use multi-factor authentication to, to establish VPN connections. 
and then within an ops system itself. So the way that we manage an operation, the operations of solutions within our managed cloud services environment uses a high level operation management system. And we use the same sort of philosophies for identifying users within it. So our users um, tie together with the users that are actually within AWS. And it's that user identity that's managed throughout our the chain of actions that the user performs and then the auditing that we capture on what that user has done. From a network access perspective, we need to look at how we can secure our networks to prevent people from accessing our internal infrastructure and da effectively data. So within AWS, we can establish a virtual private cloud, which is a bit like in Azure, there's a, a virtual network, a VNet. We can establish that private network connectivity with subnet partitioning so that we can define certain route rules that effectively air gap our traffic that's coming into or out of the environment from the public internet to private subnets that only allow communication between application servers in the solution. And we can further lock that down using firewalls or in AWS that's known as security groups to identify different instance types or asset types, the ports that they communicate on and where the effective or the, the valid source and destination traffic is arriving and coming from. In addition to that, we have intrusion prevention systems that we apply within the environment so that we can either detect or prevent certain activities for external access or other malicious activities being conducted over our network. Logging and monitoring is very important to that. So we need to capture logs around network access, any other kind of activity around uh, our cloud infrastructure. So seeing what changes over time, seeing if there's any drift in our infrastructure and being able then to apply certain threat detection to determine whether um, there's a potential threat within the environment being enacted. We need to manage our instances with hardening. So take away services that aren't required, look at the common vulnerabilities and exposures and remove any of those kinds of things apply antivirus, do vulnerability scanning, as I said, looking at common vulnerabilities and exposures, and then doing patching. So within managed cloud services, we'll patch non-production environments at the beginning of the month, and then we'll product, uh, well, midway through the month, and then we'll patch production environments at the end of every month so that there's time to test in between. Encryption's fairly straightforward. Encryption and transit, so TLS, all of the typical SSL-like traffic, if you, if you like, but the, the historical SSL approach, but now with much more secure approach with TLS 1.2 and above. Encryption at rest with secure enough algorithms and approaches for any data on disk, so encrypted volumes, encrypted data within relational databases, and any S3 buckets. And then looking at key management. So how do we rotate those keys and make sure that we're managing um, the keys in such a way that we're not just tied to a single key forever that could be exposed? And lastly, really, it's the physical security is very important as well. From a managed service provider view, we need to make sure that we have a protected SOE on all of our laptops so that if a machine was ever compromised, like stolen or lost on a train, no one could lift the creds from that to um, to get access to any of our cloud environments. From that perspective, we need to really establish multi-factor authentication for anything that's publicly accessible and really control access to our physical premises. So making sure that no one could jump on our networks here and get elevated privilege to certain features and, and components. So beyond the infrastructure security controls, as I identified earlier, really there's a set of customer responsibilities as well. And these mainly relate to the ArcGIS platform in the cloud itself. So if you are building out your own solution, obviously you'd need to build out the, the infrastructure controls as well, and then look at these things as well, the customer responsibilities. But for customers in managed cloud services, really, 
we provide a consumption layer that you can come in and start really using the platform, but you need to establish these um, security controls yourself at the very beginning of the project. So obviously you need to access the system. So either routing through your, your network, your firewalls, your proxies, and we can work with customers to, to set those up effectively. Configuration of the identity provider integration. So setting up Azure AD to use SAML authentication and really have a decoupled authentication mechanism between the cloud environment and your on-prem systems. Defining portal security settings from a perspective of anything that, you know, making sure that anonymous users can't access the system, or if you're using portal identities, making sure that the controls applied have a, a decent policy for password management or lockout after a certain number of incorrect attempts. Management of identities permitted to portal, so all of the authorization aspects of either the users to certain groups within portal, and a good way of managing that at the moment now within beyond 10.6.1 is that you can use SAML groups to manage um, authorization through your, your SAML2 approach. So you can have a fully decoupled identity and access management approach to ArcGIS Enterprise. Obviously, you need to look at which groups can access which content, and that might come down to your, your governance approach around what kind of data can be seen by which groups. And then the permissions that dif different roles of user can do within the environment. As I mentioned, there's the data classification governance and how data should be published or not published. If you're doing any development yourself, looking at ways that you can um, develop applications securely according to the OWASP project standards. And then we always recommend to have customers, even of our managed cloud services, establish a, um, a relationship with a third party um, vulnerability or penetration testing company who can identify any vulnerabilities within the system. And then we seek to remediate those very quickly before um, there's any issues identified. Just lastly, the, the, the final thing I wanted to leave you with was really the when you're considering security within the application itself, the ArcGIS software itself needs to be considered within the security scope too. So there's a fantastic resource online if you haven't seen it already called the ArcGIS Trust Center. It contains all of the information around either compliance, Esri's compliance to standards for products. It's got their compliance to standards for ArcGIS Online as well as like it, there's a there's a new feature they've actually established for the, the document repository which is a little bit like AWS artifact where you can go log in and have access to documents that give you information around securing mobile implementation patterns or setup of a secure technical implementation guide for ArcGIS enterprise or looking at you know creating an enterprise GIS security strategy within your own organizations so definitely go and have a look at that and that web application if you haven't already seen it. So that's about all I've got for you today. I'll throw it back to Alex. Great stuff, thank you, Todd. That was a really comprehensive uh, introduction to all things security and uh, great insight into the varied way uh, data security protocols and requirements can be managed in the cloud. Uh, we're, um, we're pretty much bang on. Um, end of time but i think we can probably squeeze in uh, if we've got some dedicated listeners to uh, answer one or two of the questions that came in through the session um i've got one here from from toby and he asks uh given that the public cloud providers share underlying hypervisor infrastructure for hosting virtual machine instances does this mean that those instances are insecure okay yeah um well yeah thanks alex the I think from a perspective of AWS hypervisors, AWS define really their security approach for their hypervisor technology. So they, as I said, they've established um, protected level security for a number of services, including EC2. So the ASD or the Australian Cybersecurity 
um, center has gauged that the hypervisor technology is actually secure enough. But there's a number of controls that they apply at the physical level and within the hypervisor software itself to, to mitigate any concerns around shared infrastructure. For instance, they establish their security group firewalls between the, the physical network interface and the virtual network interfaces of each of the instances. They do scrubbing of memory um, for instances between before spinning up a new instance. They do um, scrubbing of disks and volumes that are used by other instances. So there's a number of different factors that they apply to the security of the hypervisor. I kind of recommend that you go to the AWS site and, and you can log into Artifact and look at the kinds of controls that they actually apply around the, the Zen hypervisor, but it, and it's quite an interesting read. Okay, great. Um, probably time for just for one more from uh, Sarah here. And uh, she asks, uh, what is the approach for securing access to cloud provider services such as S3 from the ArcGIS platform? Any, uh, any insights there, Todd? Yeah, sure, Alex. So with the way that um, in the last few releases, Esri has been releasing functionality that integrates with um, native AWS and Azure services, such as S3 for content um, storage. And uh, I know in AWS, they use DynamoDB for um, representing all of the configs for ArcGIS server, etc. Within those um, services, you still have to supply creds for the um, system to use those services. So there's a combination of things that you can do there. You can use IAM accounts where you'd have a user key and a secret key. But obviously, having those kinds of creds stored somewhere, uh, they could be lifted, they could be um, mismanaged, they could be lost. So it's usually better to use different approaches. Within managed cloud services, we actually establish instance profiles. So each of our instances that can reach certain services have a, an instance profile that has that policy applied to it. So when the machine's running, the instance profile role is assumed by the machine. So it establishes a set of creds for a short amount of time, and then it accesses that service using those um, temporary creds. So it's inherently more secure, and it's easy to configure and manage as well. Great stuff. Thank you, Todd. Um, that's probably all we have time for in terms of questions today. Uh, thank you for attending the session and just want to uh, let everyone know that that's the first of three in our cloud series. Uh, so up next, we've got uh, cloud data storage, uh, editing and replication. Uh, next week, This time next week, Todd will be taking us through that. Um, and the week following, we'll have cloud networking and integration concepts. So, yeah, please do sign up and um, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Just on a final note, we have uh, our three three cities uh, annual conference event, Osri. Um, please do check out the registration page, um, which is esriaustralia.com.au slash events hyphen Osri. Uh, we're going to Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane uh, from mid to end of July. Uh, as always, at the end of the session, there's a chance to submit feedback. Uh, please do take a little bit of time to fill out the survey um, and you'll see that pop up at the end of the session. Um, if we didn't get to answer any of your questions today, then um, I'll forward those on to Todd and he'll get back in touch with you personally. So a big thank you, Todd, for uh, uh, presenting on the session today and everyone for attending as well. Um, and joining in the discussion at the end as well. We hope to see you next time and this time next week for the next installment. Thanks everyone.